Around the world, there's been an iodine supplementation shortage. This is interesting considering this is a supplement that most people didn't even know existed as of two weeks ago. So the question is, do you need iodine supplementation? Well, in this video, we're gonna discuss everything you need to know, how much you need to take, and what you need to do in order to protect your health. The EU has urged many residents to go out and pick up iodine supplementation. It's estimated that the uptick in buying of iodine supplementation over the past six days has been more than most people would go and buy in the course of a year. So what's happened is this really left these huge deficits, many people trying to get iodine, but are unable to pick it up. And they're having to go on waiting lists. And the fact is, is whether you're in Europe or you're in the United States, across the entire world, iodine has actually been really difficult to get. I actually use it as part of our clinical practice and we've struggled to get it just for for taking care of patients, not for the purpose of nuclear fallout. Now, here's what's going on with this. What you're probably asking yourself, why in the world are people trying to pick up all of this iodine? Well, the fact is, is that the tablets work by saturating the thyroid with iodine for 24 hours, blocking the intake of highly radioactive iodine-131 that would otherwise be readily absorbed by the organ through contaminated air, food, or water. Now, this, of course, organ that we're referring to is the thyroid. And essentially what happens is if the thyroid is in need of iodine, you're going to start absorbing it through the contaminated air, the water, and everything. And then, of course, you're gonna have that radioactive chemical just spewing throughout your body for a long time to come, which it eventually is going to lead to cancer. Now, in the event of a nuclear accident or attack, the tablet's 24-hour effect provides valuable time to seek shelter from this unstable iodine isotope. Itself, a byproduct of nuclear fission, iodine-131, begins to decay after just about eight days. So what happens is you're trying to buy yourself basically some grace period. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because I have patients who have been trained in the armed forces and basically when they were trained to deal with any type of nuclear attack of course one of the things that they have readily available is iodine tablets and i can assure you that um, the united states is well stocked up as far as the armed forces go with these iodine supplements so Let's talk about this then. Let's talk about the symptoms of iodine deficiency to see if you potentially have some. Let's also discuss the importance of it as it pertains to your everyday health, okay? But also discuss the dose that would be needed in order to protect you from a nuclear event, okay? Because the fact is, is that iodine has been important for a long time. It's not just important right now. And as we look at this particular time, the reason that people are buying it up is simply because of what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Ukraine and the threat of nuclear warfare and that kind of thing, okay? So people are trying to protect themselves. So let's jump into symptoms to see if you could actually benefit from iodine regardless of any type of nuclear attack. So the first thing and the, the, the first symptom that could happen if you are someone who is deficient in iodine is going to be the swelling of the neck, okay? And the reason that this happens is because of a goiter. Now, a goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid cells. The thyroid concentrates iodine from the food that you eat, and that's how thyroid hormone is produced. Now, if you have a lack of the iodine, essentially the thyroid cells grow larger and you get this big, huge swollen neck, and this is a goiter. And this is something that was very, very common in many places in the world, especially the United States. And this is why, of course, we have iodized salt, which we'll talk about more in just a second. Next thing that you can look for is unexpected weight gain. This is because your thyroid hormones help control the speed of your metabolism. And what you're going to find is that as we talk about many of the benefits and the symptoms associated with iodine, it has a lot to do with thyroid function. Next is gonna be fatigue and weakness because it also has a lot to do with low thyroid hormones. Hormone. Hair loss, dry flaky skin, feeling of coldness, trouble learning and remembering, it affects your brain, okay? Changes in heart rate, shortness of breath, those are some of the top symptoms you're gonna look for, okay? So then the question becomes is what is the recommended daily intake of iodine in the United States? According to the United States, 150 micrograms is good enough as far as your daily intake. Now, for a pregnant woman, it'd be right around 220 micrograms, and if you're a woman who's breastfeeding a child, somewhere right around 290 micrograms, okay? So let's talk about 
iodine and what it is, but let's also discuss how those values I just gave you, which are recommended by the United States, are a little bit controversial, right? Because the it's kind of like, well, people are still trying to figure out what's the right dose. And when you look at some of the different cultures around the world and how much they consume, you're like, wait a minute, how is it okay just to have that little amount of iodine daily and is that just enough to get you by or is that enough to actually be healthy and that's something that it's it's an important topic iodine sufficiency right because we don't want to be just on the border of a deficiency but we want to be very sufficient so that we're expressing the best health possible so iodine is an essential trace element and is recognized for its traditional role in thyroid hormone synthesis thyroid hormones regulate metabolism your energy production, which we just mentioned, throughout the body. And in turn, it affects your core body temperature, growth, reproduction, protein synthesis, and also the formation of your skin, for instance, and even hair. Now also, it will have an impact on neuromuscular function. Okay, we talked about the neurological effects that it could have on the brain. Now, iodine must be obtained from your diet or in supplement form. Many experts believe that in the United States, many people are deficient today. Now, if you look at all the people, especially women who suffer from thyroid conditions, many of them are iodine deficient. Iodine intake through seaweed consumption, such as in the Japanese population, is naturally higher than in other populations. Current estimates put Japanese daily intake of iodine from seaweed at anywhere from one to three milligrams, but some previous estimates have been even much higher, such as around 13 milligrams, even as high as 80 milligrams. Now, this is why this is important because when we start talking about a culture that's consuming regularly just through their diet, that huge amount of iodine versus the tiny little bit that the United States is recommending that you have, it's a huge difference, okay? And based off a lot of the health problems that people are struggling with today, there's a reason to believe that many people are deficient as well. Now, in other regions, the iodine content of food is dependent upon the presence and availability of iodine in the soil, okay, this would be like the United States, for instance, in which the food is grown. Now, in many countries, table salt and cattle feed have been fortified with iodine in order to help consumers meet the minimum intake requirements. For instance, the universal salt iodization was instituted to reduce the prevalence of the goiter, which we had mentioned earlier. And it's interesting to note that over the last 25 years, the consumption of iodized table salt in the United States has decreased. The consumption has decreased by 65%. Okay, and this is because so many people have been told that salt is dangerous. So many people are trying to reduce their sodium intake. Now, the fact is that's causing other issues as well, okay? Because if we were having all these goiters due to a lack of iodine, well, um, what happens when the iodized salt consumption is reduced by 65%? There's gonna be some issues that come out of that, obviously. Now, among functional medicine practitioners, there's no consensus on the actual human requirement for iodine sufficiency. Some believe that individual iodine requirements hinge upon the exposure or the consumption of something called goitrogens. Now, these are substances in food or even in your environment that interfere with the iodine utilization or thyroid hormone production. An example of a goitrogen would be something like fluoride in your water or even bromide. So what essentially happens is toxins that we're exposed to regularly are going to actually affect our ability to um, to actually uh, absorb iodine. And the fact is, is that these toxins are everywhere. They're in our clothes, they're in your cleaning products in your home, they're in the water that you're drinking. So we have to make sure that that we understand that that is a factor. Now, according to some iodine experts, the requirement of the whole human body for iodine is right around 14 milligrams or more, okay? And here's what's interesting is because there's this idea, it's like, well, how much iodine does the thyroid need? But we have to not look at just how much iodine does the thyroid need, we also have to look at how much iodine does the whole body need, right? So it's estimated like six milligrams is needed for the thyroid gland, but the rest of the body, the extra thyroidal tissues are gonna need also somewhere around you know, eight milligrams as well. So these are the areas that we really have to start turning our, our, our gears over because we wanna make sure that we're getting a sufficient amounts, not just what the US uh, has recommended in their very, very 
tiny amounts of, of iodine. So although there is not a consensus, many experts agree that the focus of sufficiency cannot reside solely with the thyroid, but rather it must be addressed through whole body sufficiency. Now, doses ranging from three milligrams up to 50 milligrams have been used very successfully in clinical practices, okay? And I'm talking clinical practices by functional medicine doctors that are actually looking to get to root causes of problems, not clinical practices that are prescribing uh, medications in order to cover up problems, okay? Now, it's believed that the intake that reflect those of seaweed consuming Japanese would come closer to meeting whole body sufficiency, okay? So we talked about the Japanese. They're consuming anywhere from like 13 milligrams all the way up to like 80 milligrams per day. Furthermore, it's a little known fact that under certain circumstances, as we are talking about in this video, high doses of the potassium iodine are going to be able to be used to saturate the thyroid and protect it in the case of an event of a nuclear accident, whether it's warfare or maybe some sort of nuclear explosion um, from a power plant or something like that. So how much would be needed in that case, okay? Well, what you would really need is somewhere right around 130, up to 130 milligrams has been recommended. What I'll do is I'll put a link to uh, an iodine supplement that we use clinically in the description below. You can check that out. But you would superdose that in the case of a nuclear explosion. If you are if you are going to be um, uh, in contact or near it, you would superdose with iodine up to 130 milligrams. Make sure that your body is well saturated with it, and that way your body doesn't uptake that very toxic and poisonous iodine and utilize it and then spew the radioactive material in your body for years to come, just riddling people with cancer. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like this one, I think you'll really like this video next.